Okay, I think um, people are still people are still coming in, but I think we should go ahead and get started. Um, wow, it's great to have everybody, and uh, whether you're here for an IBM reunion, whether you're here because you're in one of my classes and you get extra credit, or whether it's been assigned for any other reason, uh, it's really a pleasure to have you here. I'm Fred Ledley. I'm director of the Center for Integration of Science and Industry at Bentley, and we sponsor this Innovators Business Series. Um, really thrilled to have everyone and, and happy to have everybody's input as well as we work very hard to be sure that Bentley really is at the forefront of the technological innovations around us and our students are really the leaders of the next generation of companies in this area, uh, both now and in the future. It's a really special privilege to have Nick Donofrio here to speak today. Um, I've, he's been at Bentley before and, and I find him truly inspiring. Um, and I'd really like to thank uh, Mark Davis for arranging this, who will make the formal introduction. Mark, are you, are you giving extra credit for the clapping? Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, and I'd also really like to acknowledge Donna Connor and our center for making all the arrangements and, and all the hard work that goes into this. Without further ado, uh, Mark. Thanks for it. You know, it's interesting, just like in the classroom, the front rows are always empty and, it, you know, it never changes. Um, uh, Nick is here basically because of a conversation I had with Jack Thomas uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, Jack, stand up because you're the res man responsible. You know, we got to get... At the time, Jack was an adjunct professor here in the management department, he's talking to me about uh, inviting Nick to come and talk. And I said, he started to tell me all about Nick, and I said, I've, I've heard Nick talk. I was at the IBM conference in service science at Palisades, New York. And I had big arguments with people that Palisades was in New York, not in New Jersey at that time. You know? So because of Jack's willingness to pursue this, we had Nick come last year, and now we are fortunate enough to have Nick come again this year. So I, I just want to give you just a little bit of background on Nick. Uh, Nick is a 44-year IBM veteran, led IBM's technology and innovation strategies from 1997 until his retirement in October 2008. He was also vice chairman of the IBM International Foundation and chairman of the Board of Governors for IBM's Academy of Technology. Nick earned a Bachelor's of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from Rensselaer Polytech in 1967 and a Master of Science in the same discipline from Syracuse University in 1971. In addition, Nick has received several honorary doctorate degrees. Nick's many accomplishments include Industry Week's Magazine's Technology Leader of the Year in 2003, University of Arizona's Technology Executive of the Year, Rodney D. Chip Memorial Award from the Society of Women Engineers, Business Week Magazine's 25 Top Innovation Champions, Fellow Institute of the Electrical and Electronic Engineers, and a Fellow of the UK-based Royal Academy of Engineering. So without further ado, I'm going to just turn it over to Nick. Thank you. Mark, thank you very much um, for that wonderfully thoughtful introduction. But thank you very much for the short version of that introduction, because um, it's a bore, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you again here uh, at Bentley. Um, we're going to spend about an hour together, uh, whether you like it or not, uh, and um, I'm going to try to move a little faster this time than the last time I was here because I really would like to better understand what's on your mind. However, that's always difficult uh, for me uh, because this is a totally unstructured and unscripted uh, presentation, and sometimes I head in certain directions and I get a little nostalgic and I forget that I'm trying to rush through this thing uh, so you'll have to bear with me, all right? Um, what else do I want you to know about me before we begin? Uh, Mark just made one mistake in his introduction. He said I retired from IBM in 2008. That's just totally not true. I graduated from IBM in 2008 because I am not retired from anything, uh, to be candid with you. I love 
this. I love education. I love higher education. I love business. I love technology. But I really love, um, I love creating value. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight in the context of innovation for the 21st century. Now, I am a technologist. I am a bona fide, certified technologist. I'm an electrical engineer. Uh, specifically, I'm a circuit designing electrical engineer. More particularly, I am a circuit designing electrical engineer making computer chips and computers. So I actually know something about this stuff. And I actually did real work for a living at one time. I mean, I actually designed a lot of different things. So I see the world from a technology perspective. And I want you to keep that in mind as you listen to me. Um, I also want you, as you're listening to me, to be thinking about change and how you feel about it, how comfortable you are with it. Um, do you lead it? Do you follow it? Or do you avoid it? Change. You have to keep that in your mind as you listen to me. The other thing I want to say before we get started, and this, this is like one of those financial warnings that you have to stick up you know, before you have an analyst meeting. Um, I don't really mean to offend anyone this evening. I may uh, in some of the things I say, so I apologize for that up front. Um, I am likely not to teach you anything new this evening. I am likely to give you an entirely different perspective on many of the things that you think you understand and that you think you are in control of. So if you kind of put all of that together, don't be offended, don't be angry. I'll say some things, show some stuff. It's not necessarily how I feel about things, but they just happen to be kind of like the facts of life in terms of the way the world is going. Um, and then lastly, I actually know something about this topic. I led for the Council on Competitiveness many years ago now, almost 10 years ago now, the National Innovation Initiative for this country. Um, you can get a copy of that report. It's called the NII from their website. Uh, if you'd like, it's literally a uh, blueprint for how you create an innovative economy. I also did that in 13 other countries around the world as well. So you want to listen to me because I think I actually know what I'm talking about. Uh, I guess that's what I should have said in shorthand, okay? And you'll be the judge of that uh, in the end. So let's start right at the beginning. Let's start with something that is all about technology. This is a very famous curve. It's very famous and very important to people like me. It's not my curve. Uh, Ray Kurzweil put this curve together. Some of you might know who Ray Kurzweil is. Famous computer scientist. Uh, he's kind of gone a little, I think, in a different direction. He's now proposing the theory of singularity, which we won't, we won't talk about here. But this is a good Kerr. This is when he was doing important work uh, and good work. Um, and I should be careful saying that because he's probably close by here. I think he was last seen at MIT. Um, do you understand this curve? It's a semi-logarithmic plot, uh, horizontal, linear axis, 100 years. Uh, vertical axis, uh, orders of magnitude, change. And what we're plotting is for a fixed amount of money, how many calculations do you get in a fixed amount of time? We're doing that over 100 years. If you study the curve long enough, if you study the curve carefully enough, you will find that it's fundamentally a super exponential curve. That's a rising curve on a logarithmic plot. You'll also find out that it's accelerating more at the back end than at the front end, so it kind of indicates to you there's better things ahead. But more importantly, if you study it long enough, you'll find out that in 100 years, you got 16 orders of magnitude, more calculations for the same amount of time and the same price. 16 orders of magnitude. Now, I know this is a business school, but do you understand 
how big that freaking number is? That is 10 times itself 16 times. Can you come up with another industry where they've demonstrated 16 orders of magnitude improvement in anything over 100 years? It's pretty hard. It's pretty hard on the physical science side. We might be able to do some of this on the life science side at some point in time. So look at it. It's all about technological substitution. I mean, that's how this happens. You go from mechanical to electromechanical. I actually know something about this. this is where I join IBM. I'm a vacuum tube circuit designer. I actually understand what those things are. And then we go to transistors, and then we go to integrated circuits, and we just keep going up the curve into this whole world of nanotechnology, which we can talk about if you'd like. But just let me tell you, there's stuff there. It's going to continue to get better. And as a result of this, you know, you have and enjoy the lives that you enjoy. Now, you have to say to yourself, so, is that the end of the presentation? It's that simple? That's innovation? I say, no, it's not innovation. That's technology, that's invention, but it's not innovation. So what is it then? What is innovation? Hey, by the way, I must tell you that some of this stuff was good enough when I was your age, that stuff was good enough to be the innovation. It's not good enough now to be the innovation. So what is it? And what's happened? What's changed? What's changed is the entire world. That's what's changed. There's a difference in everything you can think of. There's a ubiquity to the network. You know that. You live and die by the ubiquity of the network. Um, yet. What the heck? I mean, it was only 1995. It didn't exist. It's not that long ago that nobody knew what the network was. They thought it was something entirely different. The network of what? Open standards. Um, it's not just the open standards. It's the state of openness. You, just looking at you, especially you younger folks, I mean, this is who you are. This is your ethos. You come from a different perspective than people like me. Your state of mind is much more ready for open. Open thinking, open standards, sharing. I mean, it's why you spend so much time on Facebook. It's why you Twitter. It's why all of that stuff exists an expression of this state of openness. And then it's the ability to just put businesses together that you, know, you couldn't do before. Things that were vertical had to stay vertical. Things that were horizontal had to stay horizontal. Now you can flip them all the time. Vertical things can become horizontal. Horizontal things can become vertical. You can go diagonal anytime you want because technology exists. <laughs> that allows you to do all of that stuff. So, I mean, it, it's synergistic. I mean, none of these things, the ubiquity of the network, wouldn't have happened if it weren't for technology. Where is the value in the ubiquity of the network? Is it in the device? I spent 25 years ago, 2,500 bucks, for the privilege of carrying around a 12-pound brick to talk to four people. Where was the value in that? Value was actually in the phone. People who were making money then were making money in the phone. It's not where they make their money now. They give you the phone. Sign this three-year contract, you know, just your mind for life, and we'll give you a phone once, maybe twice, in the duration of your contract. Value migrated, didn't it? The ubiquity of the network created a different environment. The invention, the technology, did something entirely different. Perhaps even unpredictable. That's what you've got to keep thinking about as you listen to me here. These are enablers. These become no longer the necessary and sufficient condition for invention or innovation. They become the necessary, but no longer the necessary and sufficient condition for innovation. Well, if that's the case, then what is it? I said we did this work. We brought lots of people together. Um, 
This is what it is, as far as I'm concerned. This is what innovation is all about. It's about your ability to unlock the hidden value that lies right there in the plain open for anyone to see, but because you understand the problem better than anyone else, you unlock that value. You unlock that value. That value can be economic value, political value, social value, educational value, I don't care. But it is unlocked because you understand the problem better than anyone else. And you don't start with the answer. You don't start with that Kurzweil curve and say, here it is. You see, it's just, it's the next year and that's the answer. And we're pretty good at that in the information technology industry. I mean, we're the people that keep making you want to buy things for no good reason. You know, buy this what? Buy this computer because it's five million pixels. And by the way, you have no idea what that is and whether or not you can actually see five million pixels. But you buy it because the person next to you has one for five. And if they're competing for you, with you for that letter grade, you better have a five million pixel thing too. And we'll keep reminding, or how about this word processor? It has 4,672 functions. You only use five, but you know, you need this thing because he has it. And if he has it, he competes with you, and therefore you never know when you might need 4,650 other functions. That doesn't work anymore. It doesn't work anymore because it's all about the creation of value. And the other thing you've got to appreciate and understand is that that value shows up in different places. Cell phone example I gave you was just a cute little example of value migrating away from the phone into the network. I mean, you know, do you think they really knew what they were doing when that all happened? Did you think that was well planned? Do you think that was all plotted out? Do you? Of course it wasn't. Telephone companies struggled. Phone companies struggle. They still do today. Trying to feed, they put in more capacity. They had no idea what to do with it. And then they tried to figure out how to fill it. And now maybe they need more capacity because somebody's actually figured out how to fill it in the end. The value might, it could be in your product. It could be in your service. They have nothing to do with your product, but your product is necessary to support the service. It could be in your model. It could be in your business model. It could be in your management model. Value migrates. You have to remember this. If you remember nothing else, remember this and you don't control it. The market controls it. The market controls it. Innovators do their best work because they understand the problem better than it. I just had a couple of very clever innovators here on campus to meet with me. They're, they're in Boston. They're moving their company, company to California. I won't, I won't say their name. They're going to they're gonna make it. These kids are going to make it. They actually have come up with a great understanding of the problem, a really deep understanding of the problem. They'll be the first to market with this idea, and this thing will rock. And they just got their first contract for five million bucks. A year ago, they were going broke. A year ago, they were going broke. They, they the guy, it's a, it's, a, it's a woman and a man team, the, the guy couldn't even come to work. He had to stay home to figure out what to do with the assets and to rejuggle them, which many startups have to do, in order to create value. Because the value they thought they were creating was useless. The problem they thought they were solving was unsolvable. Happens a lot. Incredibly innovative people. It could be societal value as well. There's a myriad of, of, of societal problems that need to be solved. Some of them you have to solve. I think the healthcare problem is a problem you have to solve whether you like it or not. The educational problem is a problem you have to solve whether you like it or not. They all need innovation in order to be solved in the final analysis. The environment you create to be innovative is a different environment. It's, it's around the outside. It's this open, collaborative, multidisciplined, global environment. But you've got to be thinking, open, collaborative. Multidisciplined, global. That's the way you have to think to be innovative. These kids that I just met um, an hour or so ago, what, are they, what is their value? Their value is in the design. 
They'll, they'll make it wherever they need to make it in the world in order for it to be the product that they need it to be. You know, so the, what are they thinking? Why, why are they thinking this way? Because they don't have any time. They have no time to get this product. Somebody will figure this out just like they did. Smart people everywhere in the world. Time is not something you have a lot of if you want to be an innovator in the final analysis. Someone is hungrier than you. That's the environment that you want to create. Multidiscipline. You don't know everything. You are, you're smart, but you're not that smart. You need somebody who knows something else that could be the part of it. That's why you're collaborative. You know, it's smart enough to say, you know, we don't need this guy. This guy with the hoodie on is just not anybody who knows anything. Just don't bring him into your network. We don't know that, do we? A priori, maybe that might be true, by the way. I don't know this kid, but, you know, it's just not a priori something you understand. So why would you preclude people? Why would you start carving people out of your network? You can't do that. All right. That's the base. The problems get bigger. The problems get tougher. The problems get harder. The opportunity is there. That's all this chart says. They're global. They're huge. They're getting bigger. They're not getting smaller. There's not ever anything for you to worry about in terms of opportunity to innovate or opportunity to be successful. Whatever, whatever you're working on, there's a bigger version of it somewhere in the world. Whether it's energy, whether it's the economic system of the world, whether it's the healthcare system of the world, whether it's the travel or transportation system of the world, it doesn't matter. The problems get bigger. The environment, water. I mean, what do you want to work on? What, what problem did you want to take on, for goodness sakes? I want to, I don't want to make you all computer scientists here, but I do want to just give you a quick understanding of how fast this industry is changing that will enable you to continue to solve those intractable problems, those incredibly difficult and challenging problems. This is an industry, as I said, I actually know something about. I mean, I wasn't there with Herman Hollerinth. You know, I didn't do the 80-column punch card. Um, do you even know what a punch card is? Does anybody remember a punch? I, I know you guys do, but do, do any of you younger? You, some of you know what I'm talking about, right? You know what the 80-column punch card looks like? Yeah. So you're familiar with the words software and hardware, right? You're very familiar with that. Did you ever wonder where those words were created? How, how did they come about? I mean, you probably never worried about where they came from, but I did. So let me explain to you. That's where it came from. The hardware was the hardware. It was the, the machine. It was the machine that read the punch card. The software was the card. It was software. You get it? It was software. You get it? It's where those words came from. And they stuck with the industry in the end. However, the industry moved incredibly fast. Those tabulating machines, we thought they were wonderful and incredible and you know, just phenomenal things that allowed us to do incredible things were replaced very quickly by computers that you could actually program. Program them. Program them to do what you want to do. Uh, program them to solve that kind of problem, this kind of a problem. You know, you could specialize them, you know. They're the, they're the computers you're all banging away at there, you know, on your lap. Programmable computers. That's the era we live in now. They're von Neumann. You don't need to know what that means. You just should know that word because when you're out at the next cocktail party, you can say, there's a von Neumann machine, and you'll impress everybody uh, by telling them it's a von Neumann machine. That's just the way it's put together. It's the architecture that we use. They're all pretty much the same, you know? They got a way to get stuff in. They got a little thing that calculates. They got a little thing that stores it. And they got a way of getting stuff out. And there's a logical flow to all of that. They get bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, they get faster and faster. They get smaller and smaller. They get cuter and cuter. But, you know, fundamentally, that Kurzweil curve drives them. So you'll get more of these things. We, get, we got computers the likes of which you can't possibly fathom. 
We've got computers solving incredible problems, big problems. We've got them working on the environment. We've got them working on the financial system. This whole thing of, uh, you know, uh, computer trading, you know? Like in picoseconds, femtoseconds, uh, yoctoseconds. You know what a yoctosecond is? You don't know what a yoctosecond is? 10 to the minus 24. <laughs> 10 to the minus, it's literally, we don't have another name beyond Yakto right now. Or, on the flip side, Yada is 10 to the 24th. We don't have anything bigger than Yada yet either. We're working on it. We're going to come up with a name soon. These are actually nationally accepted, internationally accepted names. So we got computers moving into, into, into the Yada byte world, into the Yado second world. I mean, now we're talking about you. You know, you, you got a brain that calculates at the petascale, maybe the exascale level. So we got computers that are calculating faster than you. What problem you want to solve, we can solve. That's the current world. And it's going to continue. It's going to continue. Actually, it's going to get better because we're going to move into what's called the cognitive era. You know what the word cognitive means? It's, it's like... You, you, you see and you relate, right? You're cognitive. I, I can relate to that. I start to think in a cognitive fashion. We have computers that are starting to do this. It's not necessarily the size of the computer. It's how you programmed it. You, any of you watch Jeopardy? Jeopardy, do you know what Jeopardy is? You understand what Jeopardy is, right? Did you, did you, did you somewhere along the line, read about IBM playing Jeopardy two years ago with the top two Jeopardy players. You know what that game is like, right? It's just a, it's a, general, it's a general intelligence game. You know, topics. Did you, did you know that Jeopardy has never used the same question twice? So in all the years that Jeopardy has been on the air, you can't just study the Jeopardy files and become smart because they're never going to ask you those questions again. Well, we decided to play Jeopardy. Why did we do that? We didn't do that because we just wanted to play Jeopardy and be the, you know, the undefeated champion of the world. We, we were. We did. Um, several, several years ago, we played chess against Garry Kasparov. Do you know who he is? One of the world's chess champions from Russia. We played him with a different computer. And we beat him. And of course, he'll never forgive us for beating him. And he's still looking for a rematch. But we retired Deep Blue. And we've retired Watson from playing Jeopardy. Um, because we were trying to help you understand things were changing here, too. We're in a different era. We're now in a cognitive computing era. We, can, we, 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 we th seem to be able to answer questions by general knowledge. We seem to be able to do that. It's going to only get better because more of that technology is going. So these things are going to be there for you to do something with. They are not the innovation. The innovation isn't, we call that thing that played, uh, or that, that played uh, um, Jeopardy, Watson. Um, it only costs us a couple hundred million bucks. Um, and we're never going to play Jeopardy again. And what did we win? I think we won a, a million bucks or something like that. It was a lousy investment, wasn't it? I mean, you, you spend 200 to win, a, win one? That doesn't make sense. So it was there for a different... It was there to herald this era. We're here. We're here. It's arrived. You're going to have this in, in something like that in five years. It's going to help you think better about problems and it's going to enable you to be better than you've ever been. Just as that's enabled you to be better than you've ever been. It means the professors have to be better because you know, they know you have one of those things and they can't ask you simple questions anymore because you can find all that crap, you know, like almost faster than they can invent it. So they have to ask you questions that make you think. Well, we're going to give you one of those things and then they'll have to come up with a different kind of question and a different quiz strategy because we'll give you things that will help you think as well. All of this is going to continue to happen in a world that constantly is exploding with all of this wonderful stuff that 
technology is enabling. Data, data, I mean, you know what big data is? Maybe you don't know what big data is. I mean, you know, big data is all about volume, velocity, variety, and then something you don't spend a lot of time on, veracity. How do you know it's real? Do you know what the truth is? Do you believe everything off the internet? I mean, you, you must know there are people who lie, you know, every minute of every day. You know, sending data out that's not what it seems to be. That's how you get in trouble. You click on the wrong thing, and before you know it, your computer is corrupted. Or before you know it, you're a football player at Notre Dame, you're engaged to a girl that never existed. And you thought died and comes back to life again. I mean, you know, how's that work? Um, the veracity of data is, is going to take us down. It, the volume, the, the velocity, and the variety, we can probably keep up. The veracity is what's going to kill us. And it's going to continue to explode. And all of that, we're going to deal with these systems that are cognitive, that are going to allow us to make sense of all of this stuff. I'm, I'm moving through this stuff quickly. This is, a, this is a nanotechnology thing. I'm not going to try to make you any more comfortable with, than this. Uh, there are lots of ways to continue to build computers. Uh, everything comes to an end. That's kind of what that Kurzweil chart said. You know, electromechanical, mechanical, all of that stuff phased out, vacuum tubes, and, and silicon will phase out at some point in time, but there's other stuff that people are working on. Incredibly powerful stuff, exciting stuff. There's so many different ways to make these computers happen, and it will continue to, to occur. So I, I'll leave it at that and whip through this. And then, you know, you can put these things to work in so many different ways. So we're going to live in a world that is highly instrumented. Instrumented. We make every year a billion transistors for every man, woman, and child on the planet. A billion transistors for every man, woman, and child on the planet. That's why your life is so highly instrumented. Your cars, your rooms, your pockets, your life. Everything's, everything has got some intelligence in it. I shouldn't say intelligence. Everything has some capability in it. Whether it's intelligence or not, we'll see in a few minutes instrumented. And then, of course, it's interconnected. You know, everything is interconnected. I mean, we're building, as people have said, an internet of things. I mean, we've got millions of businesses, billions of people, and soon trillions of devices connected to the all technology enabled. Now, you can ask yourself the question, is there anything innovative about any of this stuff? And you should be asking yourself that question. Because unless you can demonstrate that you've actually generated some intelligence, chances are there is no innovation in any of that stuff. And that's what people want, is intelligence. They don't want big data. They really don't. They want the intelligence that that big data represents. So don't be confused with information. Don't even be confused with knowledge. It's intelligence that people are looking for in the final analysis. That's, that's the, the base that you need if you're going to be an innovative uh, person in the end. Um, we're going to go through this quickly, and I'm going to stop here for one second. You see this? This whole idea of speed. This little example of these kids in Boston that came up to see me with their little company where they're traveling, you know, they're transferring themselves now out to California. Um, speed. They got it. They understood it. They were out of money. That's what determined speed. They, they were close to broke. Their initial um, angel funding was over. They had no value to show for it. They were not going to get anybody to give them any more money. So speed. In less than a year, they turned their whole company around. And as I said, they just signed their first $5 million contract. These kids are going to be, I don't know that they'll be Twitter rich, but they're going to be rich uh, in the final analysis. Um, problems. I could, do, I could do hours with you on the kinds of problems you should be thinking about that w fit into this instrumented, interconnected, intelligent. Do you know what Statoil is? Have you ever heard of that company? It's a famous oil company in Norway. 
right? So they explore in the North Sea. Are you familiar with the North Sea? Do you know what the North Sea is like? It's freaking cold in the North Sea. Um, so oil platforms, you're familiar with that, right? Do you remember the phrase? You have heard the phrase, right? A burning platform. You heard that phrase, right? Somebody must have used that in your life. That phrase came from the North Sea. It was a simple rule. If you put a platform in the nor oil rig in the North Sea, simple rule was don't leave the platform. You will never survive in the, in the North Sea. You, you won't survive five minutes in the North Sea. Don't leave the platform. That's what everybody who worked on those platforms, that's what everybody was drilled and told. You know the story? A rig blows up. It's a catastrophe. It's a disaster. 30% of the people leave the rig. They jump into the North Sea. How many people survived? The 30 people that jumped into the North Sea. Everybody who stayed on the platform died. A burning platform is something you have to leave. You have to move. So Stad Oil, you know what they've decided to do? They're not going to have platforms anymore. How are they going to get to that oil? Pretty innovatively. You know what they're doing? They're putting the platform on the ocean floor. They, there will be nobody on the platform. They'll be in a room like this with TVs all around them and joysticks. Seems like everybody's jumping to a joystick, right? Um, so maybe you gamers, you know, there's, all, there's hope in life for all of you. Um, <laughs> they, they will manipulate robots. They will move ships in place. They will plug the, the whatever the tube is, you know, that's going to pump the oil up into the ship. It'll, the ship will fill up and it'll move away. Now, instrumented, of course. Interconnected, of course. Intelligent, Norway. What do you know about Norway? They are the per capita richest country in the world. The richest company, the per capita richest country in the world. Um, Brazil. You know anything about Brazil? Um, Rio de Janeiro. You know anything about Rio de Janeiro? Of course you do. They're going to host the World Cup, aren't they? And then beyond, after that, they're going to host the what? The Summer Olympics. Right. What else do you know about Rio de Janeiro? It's a pretty sleazy city. It's a tough city to live in. I mean, it's got a lot of corruption. It's got a lot of crime. It's got a lot of disease. It's got a lot of all the wrong things. Five years ago, they elect a new mayor. He understands all of this. Young guy. What does he do? First thing he does, looks out his office window and he says, take that building down across the street. We're building a control center right there. And we're going to instrument everything in Rio. We instrument the water. We're going to instrument the traffic, the airflow, the quality of, of uh, Life on the street, traffic, we're going to instrument everything. And you're going to bring all of that, and we're going to watch it on those screens, and we'll have different joysticks, you know, to manage and manipulate this and that. So story goes, he did all of this in less than 12 months, and in less than 12 months, he starts to clean up Rio. It's getting better. He gets himself reelected. He'll be there for the World Cup and for the, um, uh, for the, for the Olympic Games. And it is a safer city. It's not perfectly safe, it's not, you know, it's still got issues, but it's so much better than what it was. Instrumented, interconnected, intelligent. He started with the problem, just like Stad Oil started with the problem. He started with the problem, he understood the problem better than anybody else. You're getting a pattern to these examples that I'm giving to you? Uh, I love to talk about the city of Stockholm. You know the city of Stockholm? You've ever been there? Anybody been there? A few people have been there. It's an island city. You get to it by going across bridges. Um, story goes, new mayor, a woman, gets into power within six months. She has difficulty holding her coalition together. She has to make a deal with the Green Party. You know what the Green Party is, right? These are the environmental nuts. You know, she's an ultra-conservative. She's being coached by her team. Don't, don't you dare make a deal with the Green Party. They'll kill us. 
I mean, if we're going to go out of office, we might as well go out of office now. Why, why would you make a fiasco out of making a deal with the greenies? And then we have to go out of office after that. So she says, okay, Gunnar, Gunnar Soderholm, who is the guy giving her all this advice. He's the vice mayor. She says, Gunnar, we're making a deal with the Green Party, and you're going to be the project manager for the deal with the Green Party. We're not building another bridge. We're going to lower the traffic. We're going to lower our carbon footprint, and we're going to improve the financial situation in the city of Stockholm, and you're going to make that happen. He has no idea what to do. He calls us up. We start a program with him. And within 12 months, we reduce the traffic congestion. Well, they don't need a bridge, whatever a bridge costs. I don't know. What, a, what does a bridge cost? A reasonable bridge, maybe half a billion dollars, maybe 250 million bucks. They don't have to spend that money. There's no more bridge. They lower the traffic congestion in the city of Stockholm by 30%. They improve their carbon footprint by 40% and actually get themselves a little richer because all of the people like you forget that you're not supposed to be there and we know it's you and in, in, in uh, Sweden they're allowed to take the money directly out of your account when you show up in the city center. So every time you show up, 50 bucks, thank you very much. Two bank cycles, all of a sudden everybody's like, what the hell happened to my savings account or my checking account? and everything starts to resolve itself. Instrumented, interconnected, intelligent. Sooner, sooner or, or, or uh, uh, so, uh, Gunnar Soderholm right now is a bit of a rock star. I mean, he, 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 doesn't, he doesn't do this anymore for a living. He just walks around telling this story uh, for like 40,000 uh, bucks. It's a great gig if you can get it. Uh, water, I, we could spend hours on water. You understand the problems of water? I mean, we're, we have a fixed, limited, fresh water supply for the globe. We're, 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 and we're screwing it up every day. So, what, 75% of the globe is water? Unfortunately, of that 75%, only about 5% of it's potable. And we're destroying the fresh water supply of the globe. So there's all kinds of opportunity in water whether it's in Australia, the United States, Europe, uh, Asia, people are instrumenting waterways, instrumenting them. The Hudson River has this little thing called the Beacon Institute of Rivers and Estuaries. They've instrumented the Hudson River from New York City to Albany. They now know exactly what you're doing when you do it. It's not a guess. They've got it so instrumented they know you did it, you just did it. I told you not to do that. I told you not to flush that crap into the Hudson River. You did it again. We know exactly it was you. And we know exactly you did it right now. And we're going to get you for that. So it's no longer a guess or a question about what's going on. Oh, by the way, sh don't, don't release that hot water out of that power plant because the shad are about ready to run. And if you release that hot water, you'll change the temperature in that area two degrees and there will be no row. The row will die. Don't release that water. Instrumented, interconnected, intelligence. You get the repeating pattern here? You get the repeating thinking that's going on? It doesn't have to all be this way, but I think this is really the way it's going to go, to be honest with you. You have to ask yourself the question then, if that's the way it's going to go, do we have the talent to, to, to live up to these challenges? I'm telling you, you have the technology. I told you that. We're giving you better computers. I told you that. But how about you? Are, are you educated to be able to step up, to be innovative? Are you educated in a way that allows you to be the kind of person that I said innovators are, a global, open, multidisciplined, collaborative thinker? Are you the kind of person that actually understands that value migrates? Are you the kind of person that starts with the problem, or are you the kind of person that starts with the answer? Are you an I-shaped person? I-shaped, you know what that looks like, right? I'm an electrical engineer. I'm not just an electrical engineer, I'm a circuit designing electrical engineer. I'm not just a circuit designing electrical engineer, 
I am a computer circuit designing electrical, I'm not just a computer circuit designing electrical engineer, I'm an integrated circuit computing designer electrical engineer. You get more and more and more and more specific. You get narrower and narrower. You get, become more specialized. I-shaped model. It's been around forever. <laughs> I mean, arguing 15th century, 16th century, you know, pick your point when it started. It's been around forever. Is that what we need more of in the future? To create an innovation economy. Some food for thought. Um, where are the opportunities for jobs? Where are they looking forward? Where were they looking backwards? It's a simple chart. It's OECD data. It's not mine. This data stops at 2011. Simple chart. Um, percent of the world labor population? A, agricultural sector. Makes sense. You know what the agricultural sector is. G, the goods sector. S, the services sector. OK? So that's no more complicated than that. Percent of the world labor population in each of those categories by country. And we blow up the United States here on the right. Take a look at the United States. 200 years worth of data, right, on that chart? All right. In 1800, what's the percentage of the US population that's working in agriculture? What's the percentage of population? It's something like 85%, 90%, isn't it? Almost everybody in this country is a farmer. It's not, um, there's no, it's not a trick. I'm not asking trick questions here. Is this too hard for you guys or what? I mean, you get it? Look at that chart. In 2011, what's the percentage of the population that's a farmer in this country? It's less than 5%, isn't it? 2%, something like that. What happened? Are you eating less? No. Are you enjoying food less? No. What happened? How'd that happen? Go from 80% to less than 2%? What happened? It became more productive, right? had to become more productive. You wanted to do other things. You didn't want to be a farmer anymore. There wasn't enough value for all of us to stay being farmers. We feed the world with the fewest number of people. It doesn't mean that it's not important to be a farmer. It just means that productivity took over. Why not? Our population grew. Our population is going to grow again, isn't it? We're supposed to put another 100 million Americans here between now and 2050. Isn't that the number? Something like that. Two billion more people on the globe between now and 2050. Isn't that what the forecasts say? Something like that. Do you think we're going to have more farmers in the United States or fewer by 2050? What's your guess? Of course. All right. How about goods? Goods. These are the, these are the things that clothe you, house you, move you. Goods. What's happening to that sector? It's starting to look like the agricultural sector, isn't it? So do you have fewer things? You got more things. You got more things, right? You get more friggin' things every day. You're a thing kind of a person, I can tell. You know, you like things. Everybody wants more things. And we got more people who want more things, too. It's not like we don't want more of this stuff. You want to pay more or less for your stuff. Less. He wants better quality. He wants it cheaper. He's a greedy guy. I mean, he just, but he wants what everybody else wants. It's exactly what the world wants. It's exactly what the world needs. What's going on there? What's happening? Productivity. Values migrating, isn't it? Values migrating. Now what's happening in the service sector? It's growing. What does that mean? It means any of you guys who are going to be CPAs, you're in, you're in fat city. I mean, that's what that means because that's what you are. You're in that sector. All you accountants are in that sector. That, that's where all the, that's where the growth is. Unfortunately, that's also where the people who cut your grass are, cut your hair, flip your hamburgers, fix your car. They're all in that sector. There's a high value sector in that sector that's actually accelerating. And that's what you got to focus on. Service. It's not because you want everything to be a service. It's because 
value has migrated that way. That cell phone example. You know, we still need cell phones, don't we? They come out of the goods sector. Where's their value? It's in the services sector. You write a contract. Where does the real revenue and profit show up? It doesn't show up in the cell phone. It shows up in the service. You see what's going on? It's becoming more and more complicated. You, you can do the same thing with food. Um, you know, you can buy these diet programs. Right? Sign the contract right now. Stop cooking. We'll find you wherever you are in the world. Not only will we find you, we'll make you healthier. Your hypoglycemic glycemic index will be something that we tailor every meal for you for. Sign the contract now. It's all food delivery. It's all out of the agricultural sector. There's no value ascribed to that. It's all ascribed in the services sector. Houses, I mean, you, you, you can, cars, clothes, it's, it's all kind of moving. You get the point I'm trying to make here? So it's not that that stuff isn't of itself important. Just you don't want to pay for it. You don't want to ascribe any value to it. And you do, as business people, you do understand what I'm saying here, right? So what is it about the future? What is going to go on in the future? What kind of people do we need to be able to be ready? And by the way, it's going to happen. It's, it's already happening in every country. It'll happen even faster, even in Asia. Even in countries like China and India, the services sectors are going to fly out. They're going to just grow astronomically, quickly, quickly. So what kind of people are we going to need to figure out how to be innovative? What kind of skills are we going to need going forward? We're going to need people who are more shaped like this. T-shaped people. Not I-shaped people, T-shaped people. Are you a T-shaped person? You know, you got a bona fide. You, you, you know something. You can do something. How broad do you think? How, how peripheral is your vision? How good are you at understanding that value migrates? How good are you at understanding the whole picture, the real innovation picture? Steve Jobs, I knew him well. Um, so, I mean, I, I won't speak ill of the dead, uh, but I will speak uh, about, you know, Steve. What did he really do? What did he really do other than make himself very rich, make a lot of people very rich, make you happy? What did he do? What did he really do? He just understood the problem better than anybody else. Did, did any of you have an iPod? Oh, good. You know, how, you thought that was pretty innovative, didn't you? You'd say that that was a pretty innovative thing, wouldn't you? Where did, where did that come from? Where did any, uh, where'd the iPod come from? Napster. A failed attempt by someone that Steve understood. Studied it better than anybody else studied it. Knew exactly where the flaws were. You knew you wanted it. He just knew that couldn't deliver it. So what does he build? He builds an iPod, makes contracts with everybody, takes the risk, assumes the risk, and then he sells you this crappy little hard disk drive wrapped up in plastic with two cents worth of a semiconductor in it, and you think it's the smartest thing in the world. And you're proudly showing it to everybody. Some of you even wear them. I guess they make little ones now. You can kind of clip over here. I don't know, what the hell you pay for those little ones? You probably pay 100 bucks for those little things. I don't think there's four bucks worth of anything in that stuff. Created value. And you bought into it. You bought into it. You buy into the Apple ecosystem. You can't get shit out of Apple unless you got their hardware. They have sucked you right in. I mean, the antithesis of that, of course, is Google on the other side, you know, fighting the open war. Oh, we're over here, you know. Watch Google's <laughs> start to do. I mean, Amazon, uh, you got Kindles. I mean, Amazon, Amazon does the same thing. You know, it, it kind of forces the value proposition, makes you buy into it by buying their thing. You, just get, you see what's going on here? We're talking about big deals here, folks. These are little deals. 
These are people who innovated because they understood the problem better than anybody else. Had some technology, but not a lot. There were not a lot of inventions, by the way, in the iPod. Maybe now, but not then. I, I know the guy who did the iPod for jobs, you know? Uh, Ruby Rubenstein, a good friend of mine. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Steve was the quintessential T-shaped person. The quintessential T-shaped person. And that's what you need to be thinking about. That's the kind of person you need to, I don't care whether you're an accountant, a business major, I don't care if you're an electrical engineer, I don't care if you're a chemical engineer, I don't care if you're a mathematician. Everybody needs to tee themselves up. You know, people who are this way need to go that way, people who are this way need to go that way. You gotta be cognizant of this. You have to be cognizant of this and aware of this. And many of the professors here at Bentley are. They understand. They understand that services isn't just services. There's a science to it. There's an engineering to it. There's a capability in services. It's not just, you know, feely, touchy stuff. I mean, it could be that, but it's, there's a sense to it. There's a value creation sense to it. In the end, the better years are ahead of you. They're not behind you. I, I thought when I was your age, like, how, how exciting for me to live my life on that Kurzweil curve. Like, wow. You know, like, you can't pick when you're born. It's like, you know, it's just the way it is. Like, man, was I lucky. Now as I get older and I look backwards, I say, no, no, you know? As happy as I was, you're gonna be happier. Because you're gonna be so much better enabled than I was to get the job done. There's so much opportunity, there's so much enablement, there's so many problems that want you to innovatively solve them. And all that I said and more will come to pass to enable you to be able to do that. As we close here, with my thoughts. Um, I want to um, tell you a little story about myself. So I'm a second generation American. My grandparents were all born in southern Italy. Uh, my father, God rest his soul, never got out of high school. So, 10th grade, for a myriad of reasons, the depression, uh, his mother passed away uh, as, as his younger brother was born, so he had to go home. His father barely spoke English. I think he spoke 10 words of English. He had to go home and help the family, right? But like all immigrants, you know, he knew exactly what he was doing. He knew that he was going to sacrifice his life for his kids. I, I am one of four children. I have an older brother, two younger sisters. And my father worked three jobs to make it all come together. We're Italian, as I said. So I used to say, you know, if, if it weren't for the fact that we were Italian, prideful, and could put food on the table, we'd be poor. We were poor people. Fundamentally poor people. My father didn't make 10,000 bucks a year as a guard at a criminal institution. He painted houses and he was a night watchman, every day, three jobs. Every day, the same stuff. He was also a very tough man. He was a hard guy. Yeah, there was no soft side to my father. He was a guard. I mean, he worked two other freaking jobs besides, you know, eight hours in a, in a you know, a criminal, a penal institution. And, we had a very simple philosophy at my house. Uh, dinner was report time. Everybody had to get together, and my sisters could not wait to tell my father what I did during the day. And it, 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 I eat at lightning speeds because if I didn't eat my food in the first five minutes, there would be no meal for me. I was that bad a kid growing up. So, it was never easy with my father. You know, it was not kind of a let's sit down and talk kind of relationship. I had to work three jobs because he had three jobs. I delivered newspapers, 
100 newspapers, six days a week for five years. I'm not asking for you to feel sorry for me. I won the Gannett Newsboy Scholarship. It's how I went to RPI. So it all worked out for me. But I also ended up having to work in the gas station on Saturdays. And in the good weather, we Italians love uh, gardens. I had to work the garden for my father while he painted houses and was a night watchman. So my life sucked. I didn't have much of a life. I went to school and I worked. Graduate from uh, parochial school, eighth grade, go to high school, which is right next door to where we live. That summer, that summer, that summer between my eighth year and before I even get to high school, my father has enrolled me in a math class. In New York State, you can go to summer school. And it's usually to make up, but you can get ahead too. My father enrolls me in a math class. So what the hell did you do that? I didn't say what the hell. I said, what did you do that for? Well, you know, I want you to finish up. I want you to be ahead of everybody. And by the way, you're going to do this every summer. Oh, that takes care of everything now, you know. I got no life in the school year, and I got no summer life. So I, you know, I'm not a fool. He's a tough guy. He's a guard. You know, he's about my size, a little smaller than me, but he's, he's built like a brick. I go along with this for a few years, and then one day, <clears throat> I have it. I've, I've had it. I, I just, I couldn't do it anymore. Maybe, you know, maybe it's because, you know, I'm, I'm growing up, I'm becoming a man, I don't know what it is, you know, but that year, my junior year, I kind of say, there's enough of this stuff, you know, we got to have it out, Dad. We gotta, you got to tell me why. So I ask him to sit down, you know, and I'm kind of like over here, he's over there, I said, we should talk. And he's right away, well, what do you want to talk about? And he's like you, you know, he's kind of, he's fidgeting, he's kind of giving me that smirky look that you're giving me, like, I got to get ready to go here, you know. I said, Dad, I just need to know. Why? Why, why is it? Why is it that my life is so different than everybody else's, that nothing I do is good enough, and everything in my life has to be different and changed from everyone else's, even yours? as you grew up. Why? Why is that, Dad? And I'm not sure what's going to happen here. Like right now, I'm not sure where you are on this. So I'm stepping back. But he smiles like you just smiled. And he, he, I'll never forget this. This literally has been burned into my brain. And it, it has guided me my entire adult life. He just smiles and says, because if Nothing changes. Nothing changes. If you don't like what you've been getting, don't keep doing what you've been doing, because all you're going to get is what you've been getting. It was obvious to him. You understand? It was obvious to him. His life was over. His life was to live for us. His life was to make sure that things were different for us and that we were different than him. Think about it. It's all about change, isn't it? How much do you embrace it? I asked you that in the beginning. How much do you lead it? How much do you resist it? It's going to happen. It is going to happen. And you know this. You've seen this. You're, you're living it now. And I'm, I'm here I am telling you it's going to accelerate. It doesn't get simpler. It doesn't get slower. It gets faster. The demands get bigger. The demands become more profound on you. And the opportunities become greater. <laughs> they don't diminish. There is no reason for anyone to be intimidated, to feel badly, to shrink away, to say, it's over, it's done. It's the opposite. You should be rejuvenated. You should be energized. You should be absolutely excited about the future. But that only works if you're willing to think about the problem first, the answer second. If you're willing to be open, collaborative, multidisciplinary, and global. And if you're willing to change. You do that, the world is yours. Don't do it, 
Trust me, there is somebody in the world who will. There is somebody waiting to do exactly what I just said to you. And it will happen. And if it happens in a different place, if it happens in a different country, if it happens in a different world, who knows how this world that you live in is going to work out. You enjoy the life you enjoy here because, like it or not, in this country we're innovation leaders. You lose that edge in this country. If that gap in leadership disappears, I don't know what it'll be like here. But your better days may have been behind you. That's what should motivate you. Thanks very much. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're very kind. You're very kind.